Hello, and welcome back to High Peak Education. I would now like to discuss an, another lecture on rotational motion. Namely, I would like to discuss rotational forces, rotational energy, and other things that pertain to rotation. In particular, in this lecture, we will focus on rotational statics. That is to say, what does it mean to be in static equilibrium when there is also the possibility of uh, rotational motion? And what must be a condition where an object that's in static equilibrium has to have if it could possibly rotate? So let's first take a look at this. So let's first introduce what I'm going to call rotational dynamics. So we know that forces, that is linear forces, cause translational motion. But what things cause rotation? Well, that is the study of rotational dynamics, why things rotate. Previously in the course, in a calculus-based physics one class, we studied dynamics, which was forces, which is why things move in the first place. Whereas now we're going to study rotational dynamics, why things begin to rotate or change their rotation in the first place. Now the magnitude of the force, that's the linear force, is not the only factor that affects rotational acceleration. For example, you know that a wrench, from experience I hope, is easier to turn farther up the handle that the force is applied. Also, we know that longer crowbars are more effective in prying open crates compared to shorter tools. So these tools apply what I call a torque to cause rotation. So torque is rotational force. Okay. Now, by the way, let me make a distinction here. This is not centripetal force, nor is it tangential force. Centripetal force and tangential force are linear forces that we looked at before. Those are forces that are necessary to rem keep something in rotational motion. In other words, to change the direction, that's centripetal force, or to accelerate a rotation, that's tangential force. Now, by the way, torque is going to be related to tangential force, but we'll see how that is here in just a moment. So let's introduce the notion of torque. It's a rotational force. And indeed, it is the amount of force required at a radial distance to accelerate a rotation. Now torque, at least in its most general way that it's posed, is going to be force times the perpendicular length. Now that perpendicular length is often called the lever arm or sometimes called the moment arm of rotation. And I want you to think about under what conditions is torque maximized and what angle for that matter. What helps torque to be maximized? Okay, so I want you to consider a wrench. So suppose you are trying to perform a torque on this bolt. In other words, you're going to use the wrench as your device to try to rotate the bolt. If you pull at an angle that's sort of off at an angle here, and you're not pulling uh, perpendicular. So first of all, you don't want to pull at all parallel to the wrench, because if you pull parallel to the wrench, that won't, of course, move it at all. There has to be some orthogonality. But if the orthogonality is not maximized, then the lever arm is shorter than the length of the wrench itself. Notice if we take the force and we project it so that the effective radius, that is the effective arm of rotation, is shorter than the wrench itself, but that effective arm of rotation is indeed perpendicular to the force that exists, then we have found the lever arm. So that's going to be a somewhat small torque. If you keep the same force, but you try to pull the wrench exactly perpendicular to the radius of the wrench itself, that will give you more torque, and the lever arm will be the radius of the device itself. Now, if that bolt is really stubborn, and sometimes I've been in the garage with my grandfather, and bolts are stubborn when we work on the car, we sometimes need to even put an extension on the wrench 
that is we need to get an even larger radius because if we have a larger radius we also have a larger perpendicular length and a larger lever arm or moment arm now by the way these extensions take lots of forms sometimes they're called breaker bars or cheater bars or maybe you could even just put a pipe on here but anyway this will give you more torque even though your force hasn't changed in any of these situations the force that is the linear force is the same but you want to work smarter not harder so torque definitely has to do with working smarter getting your force as perpendicular as possible and getting your force to be as long of a distance from that stubborn bolt as possible to get the maximum amount of rotational acceleration thus rotational force as possible so let us now be a little more quantitative in defining torque so what is the mathematical definition of torque okay imagine this is the wrench we were looking at before and imagine we're back in that first scenario now in that first scenario let's assume that the force is not perfectly perpendicular to the wrench itself so this will be the most general definition of torque based upon vectors and angles and defining the radius and the force so torque is going to be the lowercase Greek symbol tau that's T-A-U and the definition is going to be RF sine phi so radius times force times the sine of the smallest angle between the radius and the force now the radius goes from the pivot point or what we might call the axis of rotation out to the contact point where the force is contacting with the solid body that's trying to be rotated also note that phi is the smallest angle between the force and the radius vector and that again that radius vector has its tail at the axis of rotation and its tip at the point of the where the force contacts now if you perform a dashed imaginary line and imaginarily extend this radius vector line the smallest angle between that line and the force itself is the angle phi okay now by the way this angle phi is also going to be the angle between the force projected back and that line of the radius and then this uh, force projected back direction is sometimes called the line of action okay and notice that we can take this force and divide it up into its components notice that if phi is the angle with reference to the force and the radius extended line then the cosine component does no torque notice it could do work if this pivot point were not fixed in place but that would have to do with parallel components but look at this see this f sine phi that's the vertical component in this particular setup that's the component of the force that performs torque that is this part of the force is perpendicular to the radius now in order to calculate torque you should either take the full radius and multiply by the perpendicular component of the force or you should take the force and project it back along the line of action take the full force and then define this thing called d and d notice that is given by r sine phi and d is a smaller length in general or equal if the force is perpendicular but in general a smaller length compared to the radius itself and then that is sometimes called the lever arm or the moment arm of motion by the way projecting the force back along the line of action and then taking a smaller radius that's effectively the radius that we care about the perpendicular radius if you will getting this lever arm or moment arm is a lot more common as calculations are performed especially in higher level physics and engineering and statics moment arm or lever arm is quite important 
So notice torque emphasizes perpendicular components, whereas something like work emphasized parallel components. Now, if you have a level moment arm or a perpendicular force, this equation is a lot easier. Tau is equal to FD. Now, what are the units for torque? Notice that sine of phi is a pure number if there is a non-zero sine phi. But notice that force is in newtons and radius or lever arm for that matter is in meters. So the units for torque are newton meters. So the, I'm not saying joules, I'm saying newton meters. Okay, it's not energy, this is force at a radius. Now by the way, the common English equivalent units that one you'll will also often see is foot pounds. Now, what that means is in the English equivalent units, foot is the radius and then pounds is the force. Okay? So by the way, suppose you're trying to tighten a bolt down properly on an engine. I mean, there are manuals that say how many foot pounds or how many newton meters do you need to apply that is the torque to tighten this bolt properly. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you would look up if you wanted to get a very exact torque applied to an object. So what I want to do is I want to suggest you watch three blue, one brown. Now three blue, one brown has a wonderful video about cross products and I have the link here in the video. So if you're going to take a look at three blue, one brown, the uh, video I would recommend you watch as it relates to this concept is this video number 10 in his series called Essence of Linear Algebra. And if you take a look at this video, the visuals are amazing. And he talks all about the idea of a cross product. And he talks about how a cross product mathematically in this sort of area of a parallelogram and whether a cross product is positive or negative. And from all that, we can also get a sense of the axis of rotation. I would recommend you check this video out because that is going to be very useful for our slides and our discussion. So welcome back. Hope you enjoyed the three blue, one brown video. Again, the link is here. And I'll put the link in the description of this video. So here's the basic idea of what I want to say. What is a cross product as described by Grant Sanderson? Well, it is A cross B. Now, what is A cross B? It's the cross product between vector A and vector B that are at some angle phi between one another. And notice that C, this vector that arises, is perpendicular to both A and B. Now, first of all, the magnitude of the cross product is going to be the area of this parallelogram formed by um, vector A and vector B being added together, that is, in vector addition. Notice that this area of this parallelogram has the same area magnitude as the length of this C vector. Notice the direction of the C vector is given by the so-called right-hand rule, which I've mentioned before, but let's perform it. Take our fingers in the direction of vector A, rotate them in the direction of vector B, and the thumb points in the direction of vector C. So that is A vector cross B vector is the direction of C vector. Now, by the way, as it relates to torque, the C vector, think of that as the direction of the axis of rotation, especially considering positive and negative directions that we've discussed before. So notice vector A cross product with vector B is vector C. And the magnitude of A cross B is the magnitude of vector C. And that's AB times sine of phi. So the length of A times the length of B times the sine of of the smallest angle between them. Remember, phi can only go between 0 and 180 degrees because it's the smallest angle between those two vectors. Now, you may say this is all well and good and mathematical, but how does it relate to physics? 
Well, first of all, even before we get to that, I'd like to talk about how you calculate cross products. The first method I'm going to talk about is using unit vectors, and I'm going to title this Matt's Rule. I named this after my roommate in college because it's an amazing method I've seen before, but I've never seen anyone else name it, so I've decided to name it. And the second method I'll talk to you about is the so called determinant method. So, part one how do you know how to use cross products of unit vectors? Okay, so imagine that we have the i hat direction goes along the x axis, the j hat direction goes along the y axis, and the k hat direction goes along the z axis. i hat, j hat, k hat, that hat, little sort of caret notation above each of these letters is indicative of unit vector. Remember, unit vector means length one. So what that means is these unit vectors are only really giving us information about direction, no information about magnitude. Okay, but the point is, sometimes we'll have vectors along a single axis, and we want to perform the cross product of them. So, this is what we call Matt's rule. If we move from left to right, we are going to be getting a positive cross product. If we move from right to left, we'll be getting a negative cross product. Notice that if you stay at the same vector, then the cross product is zero. That is to say, i hat cross i hat is zero, or j hat cross j hat is zero, and k hat cross k hat is zero. How do I know that? Well, first of all, by definition, if you stay at this point, you're neither moving to the right or to the left, you're neither moving positive nor negative, and the only number that I'm aware of that is neither positive nor negative is our good friend zero. So what that means is uh, i is parallel to i hat, whereas j hat is parallel to j hat and k hat to k hat parallel. If vectors are parallel, they should have zero cross product. So we expect that when we cross product the same vector with itself, it's zero. But what if, say, i hat is crossed with j hat? So i hat is adjacent to j hat right here. So you get, get k hat for your answer. That is to say, by the right-hand rule, i hat cross j hat is the direction of k hat. I hope those of you that are watching this video verify that using the right-hand rule. Notice i hat is adjacent to j hat in this rule, and I could put another k hat over here because it would just be i, j, k, i, j, k, and so on. But the idea is that if we're moving to the right, you should assign a positive to your answer. But if you're moving to the left, you should assign a negative to your answer. Let's think about j hat cross i hat. So if I perform j hat first, and I cross with i hat, the, my thumb points in the negative k-hat direction. Why? Because I'm moving left on Matt's rule. And I can confirm that with the right-hand rule. Let's try another one. Let's try j-hat cross k-hat. So j-hat, that's the y-axis, unit vector, cross k-hat, my thumb points in the positive x direction. But how about, let's say, i-hat cross k-hat. Well, Matt's rule tells us it should be negative j hat. Let's see if we can confirm. So i is in, along the x-axis, k is out of the page, and my thumb points down, which is in the negative y direction. So I really love this rule. I think it really works well, and it's very, very useful. So let's have a look at an example. Let's look at an example that Grant Sanderson mentioned as part of the three blue, one brown. Okay. So he took the vector 3i hat plus 1j hat cross product with 2i hat minus 1j hat. Now notice 3i hat cross 2i hat by definition is 0. And then 1j hat cross product with negative 1j hat is also 0 because they're parallel. So all we need to do is 3i hat cross negative 1j hat plus 1j hat, that's from the first parentheses, cross product with 2i hat. Now, by the way, since there's a minus in here, uh, we need to keep that in mind. 
So first let's perform i hat cross j hat. So i hat cross j hat should be k hat. So again, you see from Matt's rule, i hat cross j hat should be k hat. But notice that there's a minus in here because there was a minus in this problem. So that should give us negative 3 k hat. So it's negative 3 multiplied by that positive k hat. And then how about here? Well, 1 times 2, that's the constant, should just be 2. But we need j hat cross i hat. So j hat over here, here we go, cross i hat should be negative k hat. So j, uh, yeah, cross i hat, k hat. Or, sorry, I did that wrong. Let me try again. So j cross i should be negative k. That's correct. Y axis cross the x axis of the negative z axis. Now notice both of these contribute a negative k hat. But that should make sense because if you remember from Grant's video, both of these vectors are in the xy plane. And since they're both in the xy plane, by definition, since the cross product vector will be perpendicular to both of those vectors and perpendicular to the plane that they both exist in, where they form some sort of parallelogram, then the um, direction should either be in the k hat direction or the negative k hat direction. In this particular case, it's the negative k hat direction. So that's the negative z direction. So here we go. We get negative 3 k hat plus 2 times a minus k hat, and then we get negative 5 k hat for our answer. Now, what if you think that Matt's rule is tedious? Now, by the way, I think Matt's rule really does become tedious. It can always be used, but it does become tedious, especially when you're performing the cross product of three-dimensional vectors. Okay, So when you're performing the cross product of three-dimensional vectors, you should use the determinant method. So the determinant method goes something like this. You should take i hat, j hat, k hat along the top row of a three by three matrix. You should take the vector components of the first vector A and put them as a row, as the second row of the matrix, and then the vector components of the third uh, vector as a row in the last row of the determinant. Now notice, what you do is you basically cross out this column, cross out this row, but then you take i hat and then perform this 2 by 2 determinant. That is ay times bz minus az times by, and then multiply that by i hat. Now, for the j hat, you can still do ax times bz and then az times bx. In other words, you're crossing out this column, crossing out this row. But because of how determinants work and this rank um, and dimensionality, the j hat here actually needs a minus. So that's because this is row 1, column 2. So the multiplication of the indices 1 and 2 creates an even number. And so uh, basically, you get a j hat vector that was with a minus. I don't perfectly understand that. I'm not a brilliant mathematician, but that is how it works. And then finally, with the k hat, you should perform ax times by minus ay times bx. Okay? So again, just kind of this little, almost like, what would you call it? Cross multiplying? You know, but it's a 2 by 2 determinant and then a plus k hat on that last determinant. So this is how we perform the vector cross product for especially 3 by 3 vectors. Or, well, we use a 3 by 3 matrix calculated as a determinant, and these are three-dimensional vectors. Now you may ask, what if you're in higher dimensions? Is there a cross product of vectors that are higher dimension. So I actually looked this up recently and it turns out that above three dimensions there's not really much of a cross product or an interpretation of a cross product. I think in seven dimensions or something you can perform it, maybe, but that's certainly beyond the scope of this course. So I'm certainly not going to comment on that any further. So suppose you're using that determinant method.
and suppose you take the vector cross product of two three-dimensional vectors. Suppose you have the vector 2, 2, 0, that's this vector shown in orange, that is 2 along x and 2 along y, but none across in the z direction, and you cross product that vector with uh, this pink vector, which is 0, 2, 2, that is 0 along the x direction, but 2 along the y direction and 2 along the z direction. So if you perform that cross product, notice that you should take your fingers in the orange vector, cross product with the pink vector, and then the thumb points in the direction of the red vector. So notice, if you perform those rules, you should have, let's see, 2 times 2 minus uh, 0 times 2, and then that's an i hat. Then you need 2 times 2 minus 0 times 0, that's the minus j hat, and then the k hat component is 2 times 2, 0 times 2, like so, and then hopefully you can see how this works itself out. Sorry about that, some of you couldn't see. So here's our uh, matrix. So again, for the i hat component, 2 times 2, minus 0 times 2, j hat component, minus j hat, 2 times 2, minus 0 times 0, k hat component, 2 times 2, minus 0 times 2. Okay, so that's the determinant method for cross products. I would recommend you use the determinant method if you're performing a three-dimensional vector cross product. Notice the resulting vector is perpendicular to both these vectors. Its tail has the same tail as the location of where those two vectors start. Also note that these vectors form a parallelogram. Now by the way, I think these vectors both have the same length. I think their length would be let's see, it'd be 2 squared plus 2 squared square rooted, so that would be square root of 8, so that's 2 squared of 2, and notice that um, since these both are 2 square root of 2, or square root of 8, I think this has a magnitude of 8 for the parallelogram, and that is to say the magnitude of this cross product is um, 8 units. It looks like it's twice as long as these arrows, and that's kind of what it looks like to me. Okay, so notice that here's the vector cross product we get. We get 4, and then we get 4, and then we get 4 for the magnitude of the components, but then there's a minus on the j hat. That is, it points in the positive x direction and the positive k direction. It points out this way and up but it points to the left, sort of in this y-axis direction. So again, that direction is given by the right-hand rule, and it's also given by this math using the three-dimensional determinant method cross product. By the way, you could calculate this with Matt's rule, but I just think it's more cumbersome. Now here, let's finally get into the physics. Let's talk about torque and how it's related to the cross product. So previously I was talking about torque, then I was talking about cross product. Let's merge those ideas together. The cross product of two vectors gives another vector by the right-hand rule. I've already been saying that. So we should take vector A cross vector B, get vector C. Notice that vector negative C is exactly vector B cross vector A. That is, if you take the cross product in the opposite direction, you get the exact negative of the vector. Now, by the way, what that means is cross products are not commutative. However, even though you can't change the order, if you do switch them, at least you know it's just a negative, the opposite of what you originally intended. So the right-hand rule gives vector C, vector A cross vector B. The magnitude of the cross product is vector C is equal to A, B, sine, phi. If phi equals to 0, then A cross B equals 0. That makes sense, because the two vectors are parallel. If phi equals 90 degrees, then the magnitude of the cross product is just AB. That's the maximized cross product. And from the unit vector definitions of cross products, cross product of a unit vector with itself is zero. But otherwise, these are a few examples of Matt's rule. I cross J is K hat. J hat cross K hat is I hat and k hat cross i hat is j hat. Okay, 
let's finally bring torque and cross product together. So it turns out we can define the torque vector by the following cross product. Suppose you have a radius vector that extends out from an origin. And suppose you also have a force which, compared to the radius extended dashed line, is at an angle phi. And there's some point that the tail of the force is at. And again, you imagine you can either extend the radius and there's a phi there, or extend this force back and get this radius to be perpendicular, and that'll give you the lever arm. But the idea is basically this. The torque vector is going to be the radius vector cross product with the force vector. So the magnitude of the torque is the magnitude of the radius vector times the magnitude of the force vector times the sine of the angle between those vectors, and that's sine of phi. So tau vector is r vector cross f vector. So this is the greater mathematical formalism of calculating a torque. The direction of the torque vector tells you rotation direction by the right-hand rule. Now finally, this torque example I will show in a later video. But what we'll do is we'll calculate the net torque about this axis A, given these measurements, given these forces, and then given these angles. So here's just another diagram to show you a little bit more about the right-hand rule. The cross product is perpendicular to the plane of vector A and vector B. The right-hand rule for the direction comes in several forms. Try them all and see which works best. Okay, So it's this middle method that I often use in the videos and what I often explain. I think if we point our fingers in the direction of vector A and rotate them in the direction of vector B, the thumb pointing in the direction of A cross B is easiest to see. Some people like the three finger method where vector A is the thumb, vector B is the pointer finger, and then vector A cross B is the third finger. But in certain cultures and in sign language I think having the middle finger extended like that can be offensive. Okay, <laughs> but how about if you're actually rotating something? Well, if you're actually rotating something, you can imagine the way the flathead screwdriver points is vector A, the way you're rotating in towards is vector B, and then A cross B. That's very similar using the right-hand rule here. Notice that vector B cross vector A is not equal to vector A cross vector B. Again, cross products are not commutative, but at least they're opposites of each other. Now I want to make an important comparison. I want to compare work and torque. The units of work are joules, which are Newton's times meters, but we convolve them together into one quantity. And torque is Newton meters. Notice we do not convolve them together, because that's force at a radius. These are very similar, so how do they represent different quantities if the units are so similar? Consider viewing their equations side by side. Look at this. Work is force times displacement times the cosine of the angle between them. That's phi. Torque is radius times force times the sine of the angle between them. Notice this leads us to a very important result. That work involves parallel components of a force it causes an object to speed up or slow down linearly. Whereas torque, by contrast, involves perpendicular components of a force. It causes an object to speed up or slow down rotationally. Now remember, work was the dot product of the force vector and the displacement vector. Torque is the vector product of the radius vector and the force vector. Work is a scalar, torque is a vector. This was the scalar product, this was the vector product. Notice that work has to do with making things go linearly, torque has to do with making things go rotationally. I hope you see that there's definitely some symmetry between these quantities, but certainly some differences, but they each have properties that sort of correspond in sort of different ways to one another. 
All right, so I hope that you understand the difference. All right, now I want to discuss torque from the following perspective. The linear equilibrium of rigid objects. This is the main subject of chapter 12 in our textbook. So the study of equilibrium is often just called statics, and it's important for engineering since design often is important to equilibrium. We have studied equilibrium when no rotation is involved earlier in this class. So hopefully you recall earlier in this class that we had examples of a tightrope walker on a tight rope and notice that the sum of the forces was zero. That is to say there was zero net force and there was zero acceleration. So this is a special case of Newton's second law and namely inertia takes over that the object that's at rest stays at rest. Or for that matter the object that's in motion stays in motion in a straight line and that it's not acted upon by any outside forces which are external or net forces. Um, here's an example of a cement block which is hanging in equilibrium. There's various tension forces, there's angles, and then we added them together. We had linear equilibrium. So when the acceleration is zero, there's linear equilibrium. Some of the force vectors are zero. But let's talk about a necessary condition for static equilibrium. So that's condition one, net force equal to zero, zero acceleration. But that is not the only necessary condition for total mechanical equilibrium. We also need zero rotational acceleration. That is to say zero torque. Let's imagine we have the following situation. Let's imagine there's a hockey stick and two people push on it, um, both at the center of mass and both in different directions. The net force is zero. The free body diagram shows uh, that we have equilibrium and everything's good. The object remains stationary. But what if the two hockey players push on the stick at different radial locations? That is, what if one pushes above the center of mass and one pushes below the center of mass? Now the free body diagram still says that the hockey stick should not change its position on the ice. That is, its center of mass should remain stationary. And in fact it does, because there's no linear acceleration. There's no linear force. Remember, I have mentioned this way back in the momentum chapter, but it bears repeating. Objects that rotate, if not fixed to an axis, rotate about their center of mass if they're free to rotate. But this object does rotate because even though there's no linear force, there is a rotational force. That is to say, you can have zero force but not zero torque. And when I say zero force, I mean zero net force. In other words, there are forces at play, but those forces are at radial distances from the center of mass. So even with zero force, the right hockey stick is not in equilibrium because it experiences a net torque. So now let's talk about equilibrium condition number two. So the second condition for equilibrium is the following, that we must have zero net torque. And more commonly, people write it in the following way, that all the clockwise torques have to equal the counterclockwise torques. Let's explain what we mean by that. Suppose we have two children sitting on a seesaw. Notice that in terms of their linear equilibrium or their linear forces, the net force is zero because the 250 newton force down from her weight and the 500 newton force downward from his weight are balanced by a 750 newton upward force from the fulcrum. Hopefully you know what I mean by fulcrum. That's the place where this seesaw is able to sort of rotate or teeter-totter. But notice that they're also in st static equilibrium because they have zero net torque. That is to say, she, with the smaller weight, sits at three meters radius, and he, with the larger weight, sits at 1.5 meters radius from the axis of rotation, from the fulcrum. Notice that because he is twice the mass, thus twice the weight that she is, 
he should fit at half the radius that she does. That is to say, the torque he produces is 500 times 1.5. I think that would be 750 newton meters. But his torque, notice by the right-hand rule, R cross F, he would produce a clockwise torque. I hope you see that. A clockwise torque. So his torque is ne negative by convention. Her torque, if the radius is out this way and the force is down, her torque would be counterclockwise. So her torque would be positive. So his negative 750 newton meter force and her positive 750 newton meter torque, so those two torques, should cancel to zero, so the net torque is zero. So the clockwise torque and the counterclockwise torque, the negative and the positive, have to add to zero. Another way to say this is the magnitudes of the clockwise and the counterclockwise torque must equal. So the conditions for equilibrium are the following two conditions. Some of force vectors are zero, and some of torque vectors are zero. This is total mechanical equilibrium. Now this example of mechanical equilibrium I will show in a later video. I will show how to calculate uh, that the sum of the forces are zero and the sum of the torques are zero. And we'll see various situations where uh, the man is holding the pole vaulting stick at different radii and at different locations in relationship to the center of mass. By the way, center of mass and center of gravity are the same thing as long as we're in a uniform gravitational field, which near the surface of the Earth and even well up into the atmosphere, we assume is correct. And again, these are various situations of how the man is holding the pole. Again, I will perform this example also in a later video. So this involves actually three equations, three unknowns. So the sum of the forces in the x direction have to be zero, the sum of the forces in the y direction have to be zero, and the sum of the torques also have to be zero. The last thing I want to talk about with respect to torque is something that I mentioned back in chapter nine, and namely center of mass and how center of mass relates to um, stability. Notice that we recall that the center of mass from chapter nine and how we said stability depends on the, upon the position of the center of mass. And so now we have a full understanding. Remember we said that the center of mass, if the force, that is, let's say in this case, the weight is outside the object's base of support, then it's going to topple over. It's not going to have st stability. So let's examine this. Suppose a car is lifted up with a torque. Notice that the weight vector is inside the base of support, and since the torque due to gravity will bring the car back down to the ground, its center of mass is above the base of support. Notice the base of support is where the two contact points were before we tried to torque this thing. Notice that if the force vector gets to this pivot point, in other words, if it's going to just get outside the base of support, then um, we've reached the so-called critical angle. And then notice that the critical angle is going to be uh, having a lever arm that is uh, perpendicular to the base of support, which is half the width of the base of support. So notice in situation B, the vehicle is at its critical angle, and it's exactly where the center of mass is directly over the pivot point. Finally, the center of mass is, in this last situation, outside the base of support. So the torque due to gravity will cause the car to roll over. And that is to say, if we're outside that base of support, um, there's no hope for stability for this car. Thank you very much for your attention. Please smash that like button if you enjoy this content, and please subscribe to grow the channel. Please share this amongst your social network, and I want to thank you for watching High Peak Education. I will see you in the next video.